Good morning, it's Charlie ZL2 CTM. Just thought I'd do a video to sort of do a bit of a catch up on uh, where I've got to in playing around with um, the audio amplifier design. So by way of um, sort of setting the scene and, and where I've got to to date, um, in terms of trying to work out what kind of gain I wanted to get out of the audio amp, I first looked at the overall distribution of gain across um, what will become the radio and just sort of making a few assumptions here. Um, assumptions being that the preceding stages leading up to and in, including the product detector will give me around 70 odd dB. Um, and noting that we want to have roughly, um, or aiming to have roughly 100 dB gain um, overall, then um, I can, I'm going to sort of have 30 odd dB uh, being assigned to the audio frequency amplifier stage. Um, so that's so anything greater than 30 dB um, is, is what I'm aiming for. Um, as discussed in the earlier video, um, I wanted to play around with having uh, three stages. So the first stage was going to be um, a 3904 BJT, then leading into um, the low noise op amp, the NE5534, um, and then um, after that having some kind of push-pull um, final sort of amplifier to drive the 8 ohm speaker and that's essentially what I've been playing around with and we'll have a look at very shortly so in regards to that first stage the, the 2N3904 um, just set up to be a standard uh, class A amplifier um, uh, in terms of just setting some some gimmies so to speak to, to design against uh, decided to set the, um, the quiescent collector current uh, at 10 milliamps uh, now the 3904 from the specification sheet has an FT of um, 300 megahertz, um, and because we're down at audio frequencies, we'll just use the um, the one megahertz um, gain, which will be 300. Um, so it's 300 divided by one megahertz equals a gain of 300, and of course anything less than that will be around the same anyway. And we'll set our um, emitter voltage to be around that tenth VCC. Now, again, I've, I've said this before in previous videos, um, and I'll say it again as a, an overall caveat. Um, this video is not a how-to. Um, I am not a design engineer. This is purely a, this is what I did. Um, and it may be of interest to you. So, caveat done. Right, anyway, so based on that, um, in terms of working out the various components, uh, for our emitter resistor here, We've got a tenth of VCC, VCC is 13.8 volts, so one tenth of that divided by our 10 milliamps passing through it gives us 138 ohms, so I'll just use a standard value of uh, 120. Um, R2 here, so that's going to be, um, in terms of the voltage at this point, will be uh, 0.7 greater than the emitter. So again, one tenth of VCC gives us our, our, our emitter voltage, plus 0.7 gives us the voltage at the base and then we can work out um, how much current is going to pass through there and like we've done in previous videos for a nice stiff voltage divided biasing we want to have at least 10 times the base current flowing through these two uh, resistors here so in terms of working out what the base current will be so it's our emitter uh, current which is approximately equal to our collector current so that current divided by 300 gives us our base current and then we said we, we said we wanted to have 10 times that so 10 times that so the voltage at the base divided by that current gives us 6.2k so I'll use that standard value of 6.8k um, R1 which is the uh, the upper resistor in that voltage divided biasing uh, again just looking at from Ohm's law looking at the voltage drop across that so it's going to be VCC minus whatever the voltage was at the base so that part part there is exactly what we've just seen from the previous calc and in this particular case we have 10 times current coming out through here and now we're adding one lot of base current so it'll be 11 times through here so hence the 11 times um, our base current comes out at 31.9k so I'll use 33k um, in terms of our collector resistor, I hope you can get that on the screen there. Um, I'm setting up the the uh, collector voltage here to be roughly halfway between um, VCC and ground. 
I'm going to have it slightly on the higher side so when the voltage swings down here we don't get too much close to pinch off um, with that particular transistor there. So I'm going to allow the, the maximum voltage swing at the output to be roughly 6 volts. So we can do the maths there again from um, Ohm's law. 13.8 volts, our VCC minus that 6 volt drop divided by our 10 milliamps comes out at 780 and um, I'll just use 820 ohms. Um, so those are the, the values of the resistors that we use. Um, now for the coupling um, capacitors, uh, the input and the output, and we'll look at this one in a sec. Um, again, just, just using that sort of rule of thumb, I want it to be less, or the um, capacitive reactance, I want it to be less than 100 ohms at our lowest frequency of operation. Um, why our lowest frequency? Because capacitive reactance is 1 over 2 pi Fc, so any increase in frequency will result in a decrease in our capacitive reactance because it's on the lower part of um, the fraction there. So again, we always set that to be the lowest, so we'll use 300 hertz, noting that our audio spectrum that we want to try and pass for this amplifier is um, uh, as good as 300 to 3k, so that's, that's the voice spectrum for um, voice communications. So again, uh, rearranging that equation, so simply putting the C to here and putting the XC down the bottom, we can then solve for capacitance. So 1 over 2 pi, um, 300 hertz times uh, our 100 ohms comes out at 5.3. I'm going to increase it up to um, 10 microfarads, which puts us on the safe side. Again, any increase there decreases that, so I know I'm going to be less than 100 ohms. Now for the emitter bypass um, here, I'm going to run this uh, class A amplifier flat out with no emitter degeneration, so I'm going to fully bypass that. Um, I'm going to initially try for 100 microfarads, and if I remember in the video, um, I'll do an example of where if you I did, if I used a lower value, for example, say 10 microfarads, um, the low frequency gain for this particular stage um, dropped off. By increasing that emitter bypass from 10 microfarads up to 100 microfarads, I regained um, a good amplification at that lower frequency, i.e. down by 300 hertz. Um, so that's why I've noted that is 100 hertz there. Now for the second stage, um, the second stage is, if I zoom out there a little bit, yep, uh, is that um, any 5534, that low noise amplifier there. Um, it's a, a pretty standard setup, so the input from the first stage is going to go across a 100k ohm pot, uh, which will be our master volume for the whole amplifier. And then that leads into an RN4 uh, and an RF which are the two main uh, resistors here that set the, that set the overall gain um, for this amplifier. So I've set one input at halfway between VCC and ground, so just using two 33k ohm uh, resistors there just to minimise the current draw. And then from an AC point of view, tying that point to ground through the 10 microfarad um, capacitor. Um, what else, what else, what else? So. Uh, by trial and error, so um, probably a good point then just to sort of double back a little bit. Uh, uh, shucks, what's the best time for that? I'll do it now. Um, so in terms of the in terms of the the gain here of of the overall amplifier, um, I've made an assumption here that I'm going to get in here a, a, a roughly one microvolt um, signal. So one microvolt times 72 or 70 odd dB gain gets us around here at about um, 3 millivolts. So what I decided to do is I've uh, increased that by an order of magnitude of 10, uh, one order of magnitude, so I'm now using 30 um, millivolts as the test input signal for this audio amplifier. So if I can get a nice linear output at 30 millivolts input, then I'm certainly going to have a linear output for um, one microvolt and for any stronger signals above that because it will certainly be, depending on how close people are to the radio, um, signals are a lot greater than one microvolt here. So um, 
So I used the SIG gene, which we'll look at in a sec, to feed in um, 30 millivolts into the amplifier. Anyway, so through trial and error, uh, with, the, with the following on stage, um, I played around with values for RF and RN to give a linear output, which turned out to be um, 6.8K for RN and an RF of 8.2K. And that's what I've got here. Um, set in circuit. So I just thought I'd sort of double back and talk about that. The final stage was interesting. Um, I looked and looked and looked and I didn't really, it's no doubt it's out there but I didn't actually find it unfortunately, was um, some good dialogue on the mathematics behind designing um, these sorts of amplifiers here. Uh, so the approach I took was ideally somewhere around one watt into an 8 ohm speaker, and noting that power equals voltage squared, that's the VRMS squared over R, I can then work out what that voltage is going to be. Um, so that's 2.8 volts RMS, divide that point by 0 0.7071 gives us 4 volts peak. So that's what's the 4 volts peak here, I'm sort of aiming for, uh, I'm probably not going to get it, uh, into an 8 ohm speaker. And then so that's where that, that 4 is here. So in terms of trying to work out what this value of R is, I've tried to, um, I looked at, if this point here is going to be halfway, so VCC divided by 2, um, I want to add 4 volts to that to try and get us up to uh, around here, plus another 0.7 gets us to here. So then I can go 13.8 minus that voltage, which will give us the voltage drop across here. Um, and then trying to work out the current. So again, that 4 volts peak divided by 8 ohms will give us the current through the speaker, divided by 300, um, the gain of the these two, which is the 3904 here, and then the PNP is the 3906, um, gives us an RE of 2.2K. Um, sorry, uh, over here, sorry, 13.2, uh, 1.3K, and I've used a standard value of 1200K. And I've got here an RE, which is our little emitted degeneration resistors here, of 2.2 ohms. Now, um, and I'll do it in the, in the demonstration, uh, a lot of these audio amplifiers in the push-pull arrangement here um, call for the higher power transistors, for example, the TIP31 and the TIP32. Um, when I was initially playing around with this amplifier, I didn't have any of those in the junk, in the junk box. Um, I subsequently do, and we'll do some comparisons on that. So, um, you can't get away, and I tried just to, for an experiment to have just a single 3904 and a 3906 here. And funny old thing, um, I rapidly approached um, the maximum power dissipation for those particular devices which sits at around 600 odd, I think 625 I recall, uh, milliwatts. So I had two in parallel. Um, and this configuration actually works quite well. In fact, it does work. So two um, 3904s in parallel and two uh, 3906 in parallels. And then in order to try and stabilize the current, so the current is shared between the two um, parallel devices, I, I inserted the two emitter resistors and then tried to keep those as small as reasonable to keep these sort of relatively happy given that value of resistor there and I used 2.2 ohms um, hence that reference to 2.2 ohms down here um, and as you'll see and I'll point it out in the actual um, demo uh, I did actually get hold of a uh, TIP31 and a TIP32 um, 32 being the PNP and the TIP31 being the NPN. Uh, and a lot of the dialogue about the design of these things talks about using um, a complementary pair or a, a matched pair, I should say, um, with similar gains. Uh, in terms of these two BJTs here, I used a, um, an old multimeter I have here which has the ability to measure the DC gain. Um, so I got out of the junk box a whole pile of the 3904s, a whole pile of the 3906s, and then measured the gains to come up with um, four, two of each, that had very similar voltage gains. And that's what I did there. And that was all in an effort trying to 
uh, ensure that I had linearity uh, in the output depending on what was coming in on the input. Now, and why I say that is because when I got those two TIP devices, um, I didn't have the option when I bought them to have them matched. So they just came out of whatever junk or whatever supply box out of the, um, the supplier. And if I, when I used my meter, they were significantly um, different in gain. But interesting enough, and as we'll see, they actually performed really well in circuit. Anyway, so enough said there in terms of um, in terms of uh, what I did for the, the calculations. So in terms of the actual amplifier itself, um, you can see the three stages here. This is the initial single BJT input uh, feeding into the 3904 um, and then into um, that push-pull arrangement there. If I'm not quite sure if you can sort of see there, but we've got the, uh, the two, uh, the 3904 and the 3906 in parallel with the 1234 emitter resistors. Um, you can see the two 4148s. Again, um, I've just elected to use, and I, I do this a lot with, with my radios, I'm, I'm trying to use common, simple components. So in terms of um, that push-pull amplifier, and if we go back there just very briefly, um, I just use stock standard 4148 diodes here. So 0 0.7 plus 0 0.7 there, and the idea there is trying to just get these two devices here conducting um, so more like sort of class A, A, B around there somewhere uh, in order to minimize that crossover distortion um, which can happen with a push-pull amplifier if you have these things biased um, at or just below cutoff. Um, you tend to get that um, distortion. So that's why there's these two diodes here providing that 1.4 volts between the two bases. And like I say, I've just used stock standard 4148s. Um, and then on down the bottom, which we'll have a look at, uh, those two tip devices. So again, 4148s providing that 1.4 volts between the bases. Um, the two, uh, I'll call them the, um, the collector resistors and the two um, emitter resistors there just to, to keep things happy there and provide a little bit of s um, stability should these heat up. Um, and then through, through trial and error, what I decided to run with is one ohms. So there's two one ohm resistors and then our output 470 microfarad capacitor. Right, so um, over here buried is the 8 ohm speaker. Um, I apologize, it's gonna make a bit of a racket. Um, <laughs> if I could work out a way, I would, um, I would stop that. And we've got our scope there, which will um, we'll monitor the output. The input's coming in from um, this little Pico device here. It's a, it's a, a USB um, oscilloscope but it also has the, uh, the ability to have a signal generator coming out. So the output of that is going to be, and I'll just double check, it's currently sitting on one kilohertz at 30 millivolts. So that's being fed in. And if we were to uh, just fix that up a little bit, key it up, we can start to see our output there. So again, sorry about the racket there. Um, where's our intensity? So that there is using our, our, our two 3904. Um, and so again, the two 3904 and the two 3906 transistors in parallel. I'm now going to swap the output to the TIP32. So if we were to go down here, um, this is our output to the speaker. So at the moment that's coming out of the two lots of BJTs. And then we can go down to here. And now this is the output of the two tips. And that is exactly the same. And what's really nice is no evidence of um, any kind of distortion that I can see as a result of those two devices having a wildly different um, according to my meter which you know take it with a grain of salt had different gains um, according to the spec sheets they have the same gain at DC so um, chances are it's probably more than likely my meter at fault so again so if I go sort of full volume there uh, that's the two tips
and then that's back to the two BJTs. So um, my takeaway there is they are um, very, very similar, um, if not the same. Uh, now, right, what else did I want to pass on? Excuse me, I'll just uh, check my notes here. Um, uh, I won't, I won't oh, in fact, what it is, I'll just, I'll just scope the, uh, the frequency output. So we'll go back to the tips, because at this stage, I'm probably going to stick with the, the two tip devices, simply because it gives me the least number of components uh, on the board, which just makes it a little bit easier for trying to squeeze everything in. So let me just crank that volume down so it's not so painful. And what we can do is we can just increase that a little bit. Let's do that again. Right. So it's going to sweep through the frequency on this one. So that's um, one kilohertz. That's 900 hertz. So we're now down to 500. We're now down to say 300 here. So we're still getting reasonably good um, amplification. We haven't dropped too much, which is good. And then going back up again. That's one kilohertz, two kilohertz, three kilohertz, and now we're starting to drop off up into so 10 kilohertz there, so that's fine. Um, I think that's, considering the crystal filter is probably going to have around 2.7 odd um, kilohertz passband, I think that's now 3K, back down to 2, back down to 1. So I think in terms of frequency response, um, I think we'll sort of live with that at this stage of the game. I'm sort of quite happy to, to give that a go in the actual radio itself. Um, just excuse me here while I just check my notes, make sure I covered off anything I want to talk about. Um, I won't bother at this stage playing around with demoing that um, 100 microfarads uh, bypass for the emitter resistor on that first stage. Um, suffice to say when that 100 microfarad capacitor is replaced with a 10 microfarad capacitor, um, our low frequency response at 300 hertz um, diminishes uh, quite considerably, um, which is to be expected for that uh, that class A amplifier there. Um, we talked about being matched the tips. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, right, so in terms of overall gain, the other thing I wanted to compare this amplifier with was an amplifier we built um, a couple of radios, oh, a couple of um, radios back. It's it's a it's a reasonably common amplifier that's out there. It's, the, it's a combination of a, um, the NE5534 on this side feeding into an LM380, the LM380 being a, um, a fixed gain uh, chip there. Um, so I did some comparisons between this amplifier and this one, and I was uh, getting 6 dB more out of this configuration than this. So here I was getting 30 dB, and this radio over here, I'm actually, or this amplifier here, with both either combination of the output, uh, getting um, 36 dB, which is um, which is certainly more and around what I wanted in the first place. So happy to live with that. Uh, one thing I, I I did find quite useful in in playing around with this is using I can reach it reach over the back um, for audio that the quite good is these sort of these resistor boxes here. So you can use the old alligator clips and then use these to sort of flick around and look for different different values. Had this for, for donkey's years. Um, another cheaper version you see floating around um, are these ones here where you can switch in and switch out various uh, values of resistor. Um, and I certainly find those quite useful, certainly down the audio frequencies for, for just very quickly inserting different values of resistance to try and work out um, the ideal values around the circuit. So if you've got any of those things lying around or you can get your hands on one easily then um, yeah, like I say I find them useful. So and of course the other really useful thing for for this type of development is, is using this breadboard here. Uh, again at audio frequencies works really well. It just allows you just to very quickly uh, pull in and out um, resistors and try in different various values. So um, I certainly find that useful. Okay, well I'm going to leave that there. Um, uh, I think that's, you know, like I say, I'm not an audio design engineer, nor an RF design engineer. It's just more uh, where I got to with playing around with the, the three stages. Uh, for interest's sake, I did 
try having um, this NE5534 at the input and having the um, the input RF, say again, audio going to here, the output of this going to the class A amp and then the class A amp driving the, the output. Um, that was okay, but at um, some of the, some frequencies or the higher fre uh, can't recall which way it was, I started to see some non-linearities coming in on the output. Uh, whereas if I go in this configuration, one, two, three, um, as you can see, the, the output there was was nice and linear across the whole frequency range. Um, and I didn't demo there, but if I was to drop the input down to uh, three millivolts, then I was still getting a nice output. So that was of interest, having that different um, arrangement. And why I was sort of quite keen to have the NE5534 at the input is that then allowed me to, or would have allowed me to set um, that input resistor there, because th this one here wouldn't have been here. This would be coming straight off the product detector. I could have set that to 51 ohms and then uh, adjusted that one to suit. And that R in there would have been um, suitable for uh, what the double balanced, so again that mixer which will be a um, a, a, a um, DBM wants to see 50 ohms so that would have been a nice match but like I say that couldn't happen so at the moment I've got around 600 ohms so noting that uh, our input resistance for a uh, BJT should be around um, R1 so the voltage divider R1 uh, where are we? sorry my apologies it'll be this one here so it's going to be R1 in parallel with R2 in parallel with beta times little re plus big re. Big re is being fully bypassed, so that that um, part disappears, just leaving little re, whereas little re is 26 divided by our emitter current in milliamps. So 26 divided by 10 is 2.6, 2.6 times 300, and that value there in parallel with with these two here. Um, and that works out to be um, around 600 odd ohms, so it's not an ideal match, but um, we'll give it a go and we'll, we'll see how we see how it all plays out once we get the rest of the circuit made up. Right, well I've been rambling on for way too long, so um, I'll leave that there. Um, I don't think there was anything else of great interest to pass on. One last skip through the notes. Um, no, that's all. So next steps for me, I think what would be useful is to um, is to do a direct conversion receiver. So let's go with uh, the antenna coming in. We'll go through uh, a bandpass filter. We'll have a um, an RF amplifier straight into a mixer and then straight into um, an audio frequency amplifier here. So next steps will be to build this. Um, we'll need two of those, one for uh, the first mixer coming in once we go to a super hit, and then one for uh, the product detector. Uh, we'll, we'll build the RF amp here. That'll be um, that will become our antenna amplifier later on, and then we'll look to make up a, uh, a bandpass filter here. Um, so again, I've done this in the past, sort of working backwards as you build um, parts, and then you can sort of test how they worked. Um, now I note with a, with, a, with a direct conversion receiver where we ideally want to have that sort of 100 dB plus gain across the whole thing. And I'm only getting 36 here. It's not going to be overly loud, but um, it'll at least be a way of, of checking how well that dBm is working. So um, uh, we'll make those up next, I think, if people are happy with that. Otherwise, you know, we could do the crystal filter, which we'll need for when this gets converted to a... Um, a super hit, or we could jump straight into the um, the bandpass filters. You know, I don't care which way we go. We've got to build them all at some point in time to, to get the overall radio to work. Right, well, I'm coming up in 30 minutes, so um, I'm going to need to go and have a drink of water. Um, I'll say 73s, and um, we will see you at the next video. Cheers all.